Here he is. Hello. Hey. Yes. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you? I'm good. Uh, I think I've already started this webinar by accident, but <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So no seat, no giving away any secrets in this first six minutes. Yeah, I'm about to just give my whole spiel here. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? Where are you? Where are you now? I am in Seattle. I've been here for about a month and a half. I've been on the road for three months, and half of it was actually on the road, and half of it's just been in Seattle. And so I don't know if my road trip is over. Or if I'm like, this is just a temporary pit stop. I just kind of keep redesigning at the end of every month. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah. How are you, how are you finding Seattle? You know, it's nice. I mean, I'll show you outside. Hold on a second. Yeah. So I got like a cool place and I'm like in the middle of downtown. And I uh, but it's just very gray. Like you see the sky, <laughs> it's just this blanket of cloud. It's been like this every day for the last couple of weeks, which is uh, like, it's fine for me. Like whatever, like I'm a, I'm an avid indoorsman. I like being inside. I don't need to be outside all, all that much, but uh, I do miss seeing some blue in the sky. It is nice when it's blue. Well, you're speaking to the wrong person because I'm in the UK. So it's, yeah. I imagine it's like Seattle weather by the looks of it. Exactly. Yeah. I've been in London for a couple of weeks and it's, it's the same. So um, there's that. But I got a lot of friends here. I mean, Len's here. She just she moved here with her husband like a week or two after I got here, which is cool. I've been seeing her like a few times a week. And I've got like a bunch of college friends who are also friends with me and Len. And so like every weekend, we're just like going on like hikes and hanging out and doing barbecues and stuff. So like socially, I don't think I've lived anywhere in my adult life where there have been, uh, I've had like as cool as a social sort of network going on with all my friends and stuff. So that's been like really cool. It's a big draw. There is no other city I think I could move to where I have the same thing. But uh, other than that, it's cool. How are you? What's new? Uh, not a lot is new. I've got a puppy. I don't know if I told you that last time. So No. I was one of those, we think couldn't get married in lockdown, so we got a puppy instead. Right. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you about your, your marriage plans, because in Mexico you, City, you were telling me about like, yeah... <laughs> I mean, back then it was pretty early. We didn't even know what COVID was going to look like. Now we know. What's <laughs> yeah, exactly. that? So that's um, postponed until next 
May for the time being, yeah. and we'll reassess when we get to that as well. So I really hope we don't have to change it again, but I don't know. Who knows? So just living in limbo right now. Yeah. Living in limbo. Pretty much everybody right now. Yeah. I've been doing like uh, some COVID dating recently. And that's a trip. <laughs> yeah. How is that? Do you all have it's to go funny. in like you turn up in bubble suits and stuff like that. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect because I heard like at the beginning everyone's doing these Zoom dates and I was like, I really just don't, I don't want to do a Zoom date. That sounds boring. Like I'm just going to take this time to just embrace being single and uh, just work a lot and do me. But then it's like, I mean, that was like six months ago. I'm like, all right, I'm going to start dating. So, <laughs> so far my dates have been like outdoor bars and stuff in Seattle. They got like these rooftop bars and stuff that are open. And then just like nature type stuff, like uh, let's go to the lake and walk around. Um, but keep so it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but keep it. But everyone seems to be like pretty. Like I want to date with this, the pediatrician, and she's like a doctor who's around kids, so she's like super serious, you know. Uh, everyone's got like their own level of like how much caution they want to have. So it's been like a date by date basis. That's crazy. I feel like the doctors I know are the ones who are more like casual about it. They're more like, yeah, it's it's not that. Like that's not yeah. as bad as what you're reading on it. But you read the news versus right. seeing it and dealing with it. Like it's a very. Different I think she just doesn't want to be like embarrassed. <laughs> she just like didn't want to be embarrassed, you know, at work. Like, oh yeah, I'm the one doctor who <laughs> <laughs> got COVID on a date or something. I don't know. But uh, yeah. well, my uh, my brother my brother got it recently, and his oh, did he? newborn and his girlfriend. But they were all just fine. They just had like a little cold, basically, but. Yeah, we were supposed to go down to meet, see my parents that week. And they were like, yeah, when are you come down today? And they were like, oh, wait a second. We've just had Adam's just been tested positive for COVID. So we're like, uh, mm. <laughs> we'll probably leave it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe next time. Yeah, next time. We'll see. Um, how's Indie Hackers going? Pretty good. You know, uh, I've got like some big plans for it that i'm working on and it's always like a it's like we don't have a big team you know it's me and my brother full time we just got like a stripe engineer who wasn't super happy on his team who transferred to our team which is really cool because now it's like oh shit we got like a someone who's actually writing code besides me and he just started like a week ago so that's super cool because like my weeks are like i'm spending like three four days on just podcast stuff and email and meetings and stuff like this and like that doesn't leave a lot of time to like write code for what is essentially at this point like a small social network yeah. And it's not like something that one person can do very effectively. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. And there's like a lot of code I want to write uh, and stuff I want to do to like incentivize people to, to I think, post better content on Indie Hackers. That's kind of my focus nowadays. So and in a sense, I want to like convert Indie Hackers from like just pure community into more of like a platform, which I know is vague, but I want to, a lot of that just has to do with like incentives and like who's creating the content and who's consuming the content and why they're doing it. So that's kind of what I'm going to be working on for the rest of the year. Awesome. Let's not talk about that too much and let's actually get <laughs> just I'm writing, some extra, yeah. writing some extra questions now. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, I've just forgotten the first thing you said as well. Uh, <laughs> the cons of having a really uh, short term memory. Yeah. Um, Especially just saying there's like, a, we have a small team basically and not a lot of, don't get a lot of help on the coding side until now. Yeah, you've now reminded me what I was asking. Perfect. Um, okay, let me do the whole intro thing as it is whatever o'clock it is, wherever anyone is in the audience. Um, hello, everyone. We are here today with Cortland Allen, who is co-founder founder of indie hackers um and today the title for this uh little session is there's the, the strategic and tactical elements of community um and we'll jump in with Cortland shortly we'll leave a couple more minutes just to let some more people trickle in um it's more of a casual q a style right. we'll just shoot the shit about community stuff Mm -hmm. um this is the first session i've done in this community program so cool i'm uh 
if I'm a little rusty, I'm sure people yeah, in the, the test case. Now, yeah. Hey, Tessa. Nice to see you. Everyone remember that there's a chat function. Uh, make sure you, in the to column, you can put to all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, you're just sending it to Cortland and myself. Uh, there's also a Q&A tab at the bottom. Cortland knows how to use it. Nice. There's a Q&A uh, tab as well. If you want to throw a few questions in, um, we will try and get to those as well after we've done some of the prepared stuff. Um, yeah, just pop them in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Then we can answer them live. And as always, it's all being recorded for uh, catching up later on. Um, yeah, I think we could probably get started unless I'm being told in, oh, I've been told I've got to put a dollar in the swear jar. Um, oh yeah? yeah? Yeah, what's the deal with profanity here? I I swear, so I'm just, that's the <laughs> You just pay a dollar. Yeah, exactly. That. I'll, just take the, I'll just take the hit. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, let's jump into it. Why don't you just give us a brief intro of like you and how Indie Hackers came about, what was, I know I've heard it a couple of times, I'm sure other people have, mm -hmm. so we can have the, the shorter version of like how you got into this, where's, where's it all come yeah. from? Cool. So, um, hi everybody, I'm Cortland. I got my start in, hold on, let me change my headphones so I don't have this noise canceling thing on. Uh, so I started Indie Hackers in 2016. The sort of genesis of the idea was that I had been living in San Francisco for years, doing this sort of high growth, you know, aim for a unicorn status startup thing. And it never really worked out because VCs kind of force you to this binary outcome. Like either you hit a billion dollars or you die trying. And a lot of my companies died trying. So I decided I wanted to like take a, a chiller route and just like build something on the internet, just any business on the internet that could generate enough revenue for me to pay my rent, pay my bills, live a comfortable life and then figure out what I wanted to do. And it turned out that at the time, uh, there just wasn't a lot of media and news about people doing this. Like you turned anywhere, uh, all you saw were stories of companies raising millions of dollars from investors and trying to become unicorns. And that was pretty much it. But I knew that in some places on the internet, people were writing about doing this kind of stuff. So I went there to try to figure out, okay, what are these people doing? What are their strategies? Like, what can I learn from them so I can do the same thing? And after about three days of uh, trying really hard to like look at what they're doing and reverse engineer and come up with my own idea, I realized that the idea was staring me in the face, which is that a bunch of other people were doing the exact same thing that I was doing. Like yeah. I could see them in the comments asking all these questions to the same people I was asking questions to. And I was like, I should just build something to help these people do what I'm trying to do. And so uh, Andy Hackers was born. I started interviewing people and asking them for their stories and not just like kind of the vague fluffy, you know, useless version of their story, but like the behind the scenes, like how much money are you making? How did you come up with your idea? How did you, you know, market and get your first customers? What are your challenges? How'd you build your product? The kind of questions that help makers who actually want to do the real thing that these other people are doing. And I put them all up on a website and I launched it. And within a week I had like a couple thousand email subscribers and every week I published new interviews. I eventually added a community. So all of these indie hackers could help each other and added a podcast. And that was in 2016. 2017, Stripe acquired Indie Hackers. So now I'm a full-time employee at Stripe. I report to the CEO, talk to him like maybe once a quarter, but really I just do my own thing and they just fund me to grow Indie Hackers and make it bigger and better, which it has. So it's like 2020 now, like we've got uh, over 100,000 people on the community forum. You know, there's thousands of comments every single day, uh, a couple hundred posts every single day. We've got a directory of products with like 12,000 products in there. People who are Indie Hacking and sharing their stories and their timelines and all their updates and the goal is to just continue building on it and make it an even bigger and better community. Awesome. Um, you said you were hanging out in places where other people you found like, Oh, the same people are talking about that, like a commenting and that's mm -hmm. where you figured out to create your own community for that. Where, what community yeah. were you on where you saw these other people, other Indian hacker news, hacker news. So hacker news for those who've never been is uh, it's kind of like this hodgepodge, I don't even know if you would call Hacker News a community. It's on the border, but it's kind of like a social news site where people share links to different news. It's been around in the Valley for like 12, 13 years. I've been a member for over 10 years and you can reliably go there. And like, I don't know if this still happens as much now because of Indie Hackers, but back in the day, like every month there'd be like a giant post somebody would make 
or it's like, hey, people running a SaaS company with just one person or who bootstrapped, share your revenue numbers or share your idea or share what you're working on. And there would just be hundreds of comments of people like me who are excited to jump in and like share what they were doing or ask questions of people who shared what they were doing. And that was pretty much it. And I thought what was cool about that was uh, it was proof positive that people like cared about this, right? When yeah. you see people like spending all their time and like, actually doing this and it's like, oh, obviously there's like some energy and momentum here. You know, for every one person who's commenting or posting on a forum, there's probably 10 or 20 or 100 who are just lurkers. And there's thousands of people commenting on these things. But the problem is Hacker News is not made for this use case. Like it doesn't cater specifically to these people. They're just kind of using it and finding each other here. And so like it's an obvious kind of gap in the market where everyone has a lot of energy that you see. Like I wasn't guessing or theorizing. Like I could see the proof there. But the product that they're using sucked. And these posts would like die on the vine and they only come back once every month. And if you weren't there at the right point in time, you would miss your opportunity to participate. So uh, I was pretty lucky that like I was aware that that little impromptu community within Hacker News even existed. So why, why, did, you, why did you change what you said about Hacker News? You first said it was a community and then you said, I don't know if you call yeah. it that. So what, what, yeah. what then changes the category for that for you? I think, I mean, specifically, it's like, what is their community built around? Because you could call it a community and I think it's fine. And like all of these things are, uh, all these designations, you know, have, uh, they're fuzzy at the borders, right? It's hard to really classify and draw a hard line. Like this is where things is a community and this sort of thing isn't a community. Yeah. But with Hacker News, I think it's just so big that it's hard to kind of see the same names over and over. You often see like random names. And I think the thing that people sort of, like the main activity going on there is like, I think the main value you get from Hacker News is like discovering what's going on, specifically like reading the news links that people share. Whereas the way that I think about communities that the primary value you get is your interactions with the other people. So for some people like me, like I treat Hacker News as a community. I have like probably 10,000 karma points there. I've made thousands of comments over the last decade. The value that I get is by interacting with like what people are saying, like sharing my ideas, getting responses, reading other people's ideas, bouncing my ideas off of them. Um, whereas I think the value that the vast majority of Hacker News readers get is like they don't even go to the comments. They just look at the stories and click like whatever the top news is for the day. So it's a little bit of a hybrid community slash news sharing site. Yeah, do you think that's sort of what Reddit is, was before? Reddit certainly was that. It was yeah, like, then, uh, almost the exact same thing, just news, basically, and links. Yeah, and then it seems like Reddit itself kind of is a community, but it's split up into these sub-communities, whereas Hacker News never split up. It's almost like exactly. that's where you saw your opportunity is, to split one of these sub-communities up right. and get them the home. There's this whole idea in like business, especially in tech, but just bundling and unbundling, right? Like you, you see any business that gets particularly big and what happens is it turns out that there are all these little niches that are inside that business and you can kind of unbundle it. So if you read like, if you're a fan of like Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, they talk a lot about like these magazines back in the fifties and sixties where they were just like these very general purpose magazines. But guess what? Like if there's a bunch of people who like, I don't know, like dirt bike racing, and you make a dirt bike racing magazine for them, they're going to love your magazine way more than they like the giant magazine that like every, you know, once every couple months kind of has a dirt bike racing mention. And I think that's what happened with Hacker News. Um, there's just so much that goes in, goes on in this huge monolithic community. And because they aren't really actively unbundling themselves, if you look at Hacker News, you see like these, these posts where people are sort of like, you know, engaging in random traditions or, or conversing about something, you can probably unbundle it and just go build a better version of that yourself. And you can sort of leech users from Hacker News who are doing that already there and be like, hey, I've made a place specifically for us to do this that's even better than Hacker News. Whereas I think Reddit unbundled itself. They were like, okay, we're a link sharing site. Then I think like maybe a year in, they added commenting, so they became more of a community. And then they started adding subreddits so they could discuss very specific stuff. And you can still like unbundle Reddit. Like they have some subreddits where like the model and the way the product works still isn't quite as good as if you built your own custom thing that was catered toward that use case. But it's much harder because they've actually split themselves into like a million little communities and those communities compete with each other and they're run by people who are incentivized to grow them. And so some of them get big, most of them fail. You've never heard of them, but I think it's a, it's a cool, it's cool to see what they did and the way that they prevented being unbundled. Yeah, I think, and even now, so when I did a podcast episode with Greg Eisenberg, who's coming on for a session Later in the yeah. program, he's ta he talks about like the unbundling of Reddit, saying that exactly. there, are, there are now these um, subreddits that are so big that you can now like unbundle them and you can build products to serve that smaller community or even just have like some community aspect of a sub community. So that's like 
a very yeah. nice community within community within community. Um, exactly. Do you, think, do you think there's, because there's, there's quite a few posts that get a lot of attention, like the unbundling of Reddit, unbundling mm -hmm. of Cra Craigslist, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen one of the unbundling of Hacker News. And do you, think, <laughs> do you think that, I think that could be like quite an interesting one, actually, because I don't know that the people on Hacker News are necessarily looking to unbundle it. They're like, it seems mm. like a, a cult of, I am on Hacker News and that's my place. I wouldn't right. dare like <laughs> go and do this other thing where you sort of just did. Um, but I wonder- So if Hacker News has been unbundled. I think what's interesting about it is I think that when a particular resource starts to unbundle itself, it just becomes more obvious to people, oh, I could unbundle it too. So you have Craigslist, but Craigslist, when you go to the homepage, is like a million little different categories. And then it's really obvious that like, oh, you could take out one of those categories or you could create your own additional category. And it's just like, I think it just gives you that prompt or that trigger to have that idea. Whereas with Hacker News, it's just one giant list. And it's really like, you have to be a little bit more creative, I think, to even consider that there is something to unbundle here, um, which is counterintuitive. You think it'd be the opposite way, but it's, it's not. Like you said, there's a lot of talk about unbundling Reddit. There's been a lot of talk for 10, 15 years about unbundling Craigslist, but no one on Hacker News talks about it. That being said, people have done it. So there's uh, Lobsters. It's like yeah. Lobster yeah, yeah. and then .rs. Yeah. Uh, that's like a Hacker News, I think, that's just specifically for um, software engineering. Because people who are on Hacker News are like, I hate all these topics that are related to startups. We only want to talk about code. <laughs> and then there's another one like Barnacles, which is similar to any hackers, actually. It's like a Hacker News that's only for bootstrapped founders. And so they liked the part of Hacker News that was the bootstrapping and that, that's all you submit there. And then like people have unbundled like the jobs part of Hacker News or like the show HN parts of Hacker News. And then there've been like certain traditions on Hacker News that people have tried to unbundle. Um, and like there've been varying degrees of success. Like I, I don't know any that have gotten super big, yeah. uh, but like people have tried it and I just think it's a little bit less obvious. Yeah, that's interesting. So what makes like, what qualifications did you have yourself or feel like you had the skills to then go, well, I will unbundle this piece <laughs> and I can do it and I'm going to do it. And that's, and you did to be fair. So I, I had no qualifications. <laughs> uh, I mean, like I've got like a, I've got a good like tech founder resume. It's like, oh, I went to MIT and I'm a computer scientist. I can code. Right. I did YC. Right. But like, ultimately, like, guess what? There's a million people on earth who can code and now we've got no code. So there's a million people who can build stuff, even though they can't code. Yeah. And uh, none of my startups in the past that I had started like really took off. So like, if anything, like I was kind of down on myself confidence wise, like, oh, you know, I've tried a lot of stuff that just didn't work. Uh, and so the real difference between when I started Indie Hackers and like the things that I had started beforehand was that I was a lot more deliberate about kind of validating that the idea worked. Because I think what most people do um, is when you have a new idea, you just get excited about it. You're like, oh, I want to do this. And you almost immediately, I mean, it's kind of two types of people. There's people who like have an idea and they never do anything. And they, you know, 30 years from now, they're like, oh, if only I'd started that thing, someone else did it. And then there are people who are like me, who are like, have an idea and get to work immediately and like, don't consider the strategic element of it whatsoever. And they just go on purely on passion. And then there's like a smaller third group of people who like actually sit down and like do a business plan or like some sort of like, some sort of analysis. So before I started Indie Hackers, I, I kind of look back on like six, seven years of startup failure. And I'm like, well, almost every single company that I've started, like, the challenges that I faced were pretty predictable. And if I had sat down in the beginning and really just thought through it for a few hours, like I would have seen these challenges coming and been better prepared to handle them. Maybe I wouldn't have succeeded, but like at least they wouldn't have been like, you know, surprising. And so I think I had like a, a simple checklist at the time that was like six or seven things. Like, how do I know this is a good idea? And it's something I'm going to want to work on. So I, I don't, from memory, I don't know all of them, but it was stuff like, is this an idea that like, I'm going to be excited to work on for many years, not just for like the next few weeks. Yeah. Is this an idea that like, I think my friends and family will understand when I tell it, tell it to them because in the past like, I'd started stuff and when I tell people about it, they just kind of like, oh, cool, whatever. And like, that's demotivating to me. Like I want the people I know to understand what I'm doing and think it's cool. Uh, is this an idea that like, I know where the marketing channel is because finding your first few customers is really hard to do. And in this situation, like Indie Hackers checked all these boxes because Hacker News was like my marketing channel. And I was really comfortable with Hacker News. And I knew how to get a post to the top of Hacker News where my ideal target audience would see it. So I just had like this kind of checklist of like, make sure this idea actually is a good one before I jumped into it. And so even though I didn't feel like I was necessarily like the person who was qualified to do it, I did feel like I had done my research. And this wasn't like months of research. This was like a few hours of just like yeah. crossing my T's, dot my I's. And then um, 
kind of the last thing was like before I decided like, okay, what's a product going to look like? I tried to have a, a very problem first approach. So this is another thing that I think is really easy to get wrong in like the very first few days of your startup. And it doesn't even matter if it's a startup, like anything that you do, that's not just for yourself. It could be a hobby. It could be a community. It could be a business. It could be anything that you want other people to use. You almost always want to like spend more time in the beginning thinking through their eyes than thinking through your eyes, which is not a natural thing to do as a human being. Like we go through our whole lives thinking through our own eyes. You know, how am I going to make money? How am I going to get a promotion? What am I going to eat? And it's very unnatural to like step out of yourself and be like, why do other people take time out of their day to do things? And why are they going to take time out of their day to use what I'm doing? And so for any hackers, what that look like, and I think anybody starting a community, they should have kind of the same idea here is like, why do people belong to communities? Why do people talk to each other? Why do people share things? Why do people um, rely on each other and, and spend a ton of time just like conversing? And what makes it good? And so for me, I just kind of had to reverse engineer what people were already doing because I was lucky enough to see that people were already doing this. And I could go to the comments and see like, here are the questions that everybody is answering. Like I see these are asking, I see these questions come up over and over again. Like how much money is your company making when everybody, whenever somebody would share a story and not share their revenue? Or like, how did you find your first users? Whenever somebody would share a story, but not share how they found their first users. And it became really obvious, like, okay, these people who are excited about this, they're all like aspiring founders. They all care about arguably pretty private information and like business secrets that like most people aren't that excited to share. And the comments that get voted to the top are all the people who are just the most transparent, helpful people. So if I'm gonna build this community, it needs to be built around very transparent stories where people share all of, this detail, all of these details. And at the time, there were a lot of other websites like Andy Hackers where people interview founders, but they just didn't take the time to look at like what people actually wanted. So they didn't have revenue numbers and they didn't like have like these really specific transparent details because they just thought like, oh, I want to build a community. Here's what I want to build. They didn't think like what do community members actually want and like what have they proven that they care about. So I think when I kind of finally broke ground and started writing code and like tried to make this actually happen, I felt pretty confident that like, you know, at least all the boxes I could think of, I had checked. And if there are some other boxes, some unknown unknowns that I wasn't aware, like prepared for, like I might run into those when I get them, get to them. But like, I was pretty happy that like, this is an idea that I can make work. Yeah. I think it's quite interesting how you said there's like two or three things you said there, which I think people should think through when building a product or a community. And I think it's the same either way, which is how do I get people to come like a community? You need people there for it to be a community. Like you need to get people in. So if you know where you're going to get them, how you're going to like get them in, yeah. that's obviously a key piece. The other piece was you like broke down the format of how, what is the topic starter? Like what kicks off those conversations straight away yeah. and like nailed that before, I assume before you even started doing these interviews and things, which there's one thing to have that format, but then another thing to, I think you, you might have been, might have picked the right people, I suppose, to start off with who would share their numbers, which would then yeah. sort of snowball a bit and let other people feel and put themselves in that position to share numbers. Cause that's like, that's not a thing people do in the startup world. That's not allowed. Right. No one can do that. Right. Well, it's not yeah. it's about revenue. It's about how much you've raised, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I think, and just business in general, it's kind of like, it's like we're living in this weird, bizarre world where like now people are super transparent and I could I have a long spiel about why this is happening. Um, but it's to do with like just the dynamics of the web. But like traditionally, like business leaders don't like to share numbers or strategies or anything like that. Like it's not uh, a thing that's typically done. And so I think that was another thing that helped the site stand out in the early days, which is like, oh, wow, like I have literally nowhere on earth I could go to learn how to start a company like this, except for indie hackers, you know, or these like hard to find hacker news posts. And so I think that was, it was kind of a cool thing. Nowadays, like everybody's transparent, not everybody, but like a lot of people are, you can find it on Twitter. You can find it everywhere. But back yeah. then it was a lot rarer. Uh, we also have like some Q and A. Should we do the Q and A after or should I answer these questions now? We'll, we'll do them uh, towards the end. I'll, I'll sort of like throw them in cool. as, as we can. Um, okay. Yeah, that's what I tried to just touch on that because it was about like Tessera has asked about the format and stuff. So for the, right. end, so yeah, I managed to bring that in, which is good, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so when you were building Indie Hackers, and I want to get into like the community community bit, but mm -hmm. it's almost like you were building not a community first. You were building like a place for people just to, to be or read, oh. not necessarily the, like the forum piece, the back and forth came much later, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I had like a whole roadmap 
uh, kind of like a step-by-step plan. And this is another thing that I think is super important if you're going to create anything, especially if you're trying to be ambitious. It doesn't matter how big your ambition is. Like you have to start small. No one ever started big. Like if you look at Walmart, like the story of Walmart, it was like one tiny corner store. And then it was two corner stores. Then it was three corner stores. And eventually it became a behemoth. I think what happens when a lot of people start is like they have this grand vision and they don't break it down and figure out like, what are the baby steps? Like, what are the, like, like, it's like if you're climbing a staircase is my favorite analogy. Like you don't try to jump to the top of the staircase. You take like one step and that step gives you like a height advantage and makes the second step easier to reach. And so for me, my steps are like, I want to have a community because I think community would be really cool. And I was very inspired by this website, Nomad List, which is also monetizing through having a community. I was like, how do you get to the point where you have a community? It's not easy to do. Um, because like, it's kind of like this chicken and egg problem. Like no one wants to be part of an empty community. So the approach I had was like, first I'll start off with compelling content. I know from my research, what these types of people, I know who I'm targeting. Like I have a very clear customer profile in mind, which also means that I'm excluding some people, which is a huge step. You have to always like know who you're targeting and who you're not targeting. And if you're building something for everybody, I think you're starting way too big. Um, I know what appeals to them and how to get them all to come. Like they want to read this particular content. All I have to do is just like, do some interviews and like make sure the content is there and it's really good. And I know these people want to read it. I know where to find them. And then I just need to be able to contact them again. So I need to put like a mailing list capture form on here so I can email them when there's new interviews or something. And if I can do that and build up a mailing list of these people, that's kind of step two, build up the mailing list. Then I can do step three, which is create a community. And of course the community is going to be empty and desolate in the beginning, but at least now I have like hundreds or thousands of people that I can email and be like, Hey, check out this community. And I know that building a community is not like a one shot and you're done. You send out one email and now you've got a great community. It's like a lot of work because I talked to Peter Levels like, hey, how did you build your community? And he's like, it took months. So I'm like, okay, well, if I have an email list, I can literally just email them every single week about the community over and over and over again, week after week, month after month for maybe years, who knows how long it was going to take. And that'll help my community get started. And so in the very beginning of the community, which I launched like maybe a month and a half after like the blog and the interviews, uh, it was just me with some fake accounts kind of seeding the community with some like weird discussions or just me talking to myself, which is what the Reddit guys did. And I would email those discussions out to my list. And if I didn't have a list, if I didn't have a place where I could like try to bring people in, like the community never would have gotten off the ground because even with the list of like 3000 people or something, which was a lot, like very few of them clicked through the community and like created an account and started talking to like one of my fake accounts. Like in the first week, it was like a few people did it. And then like a few more people did it. And then like, I think the third week, I finally saw like two people talking to each other instead of talking to like one of my fake accounts. And it was just like relentlessly doing this process over and over and over again for weeks until it got to the point where the community is like self-sustaining. Like I could go on a backpacking trip right now for a month and come back and there still would have been thousands of discussions on indie hackers. But in the very early days, it wasn't the case. Yeah. So did you hear the, did you hear the story about the Reddit guys and then just go, yeah, I'll just do that. And like, Make it feel like because <laughs> I think part of it yeah. is lead it like I whenever people ask me about like product hunt days, I just think, well, you've got to sort of lead by example. And mm-hmm. I would I would make sure I would go and ask stupid questions. So if someone did a product launch, I would ask like a really basic question. So no yep. one can ask a stupider question than me, basically. So it's like, oh, if you can I ask like that, that, I can ask something else. Like yeah. I can definitely ask how they made their logo. Smart. It depends off that stupid thing. So that's how that was my approach. Um but yeah, it is, it's just must be a, such a strange place to be to have like, I don't know how many accounts you had. Just like, I had like maybe like 10 and yeah. they're still around. Like I, no one's ever found any of them, which is funny to me, but like I post on them every now and then I want to say something not under my own name, but I like your product hunt approach. Like you want to lead by example and I like how you were uh, thoughtful about it. You would ask a stupid question. So everybody else would feel comfortable asking a question, which you have to be kind of careful with because then people might just other, ask other stupid questions. But like, if that's what you want, that's totally cool. Yeah. And what I wanted was the people to have like these like strategic kind of like, how do you do X, Y, Z sort of startup questions? And I think this is another thing that's important about community, which is like, why does your community exist? Because you can't create a community about every topic. Like people don't want to gather and discuss every single topic under the sun. Startups for me, I think were an obvious choice because startups are really hard. People who try to start companies have a lot of questions, a lot of problems. They want to share their stories. There's just like a, a million things to talk about, which makes it like a really great place to have a community. And there's a million problems that startup founders have that are solved by being part of a community, whether it's you want advice on a particular website you're building, or you want to find a co-founder, or you're stuck on your code, or you're like feeling down and you just want to share your story. Like these are all socially solved problems. And so I just created like a huge variety of different discussions. And I'm still learning like what kinds of discussions, you know, catch on, what kind of discussions are like boring, you know, what gets repetitive over time. 
but um i had like maybe you know, five or ten accounts and i was just trying to like post as much as i could to be honest and this is not the only way to do it like when i talked to peter levels about nomad list the way that he grew his community in the early days was he did a lot of amas and like for whatever reason i didn't do that like i had the perfect platform to do it i'm already interviewing people i could be like hey we just did an interview do an ama and that could draw people into the community yeah. but i didn't i did like the reddit fake accounts approach and there are other ways you can do it as well yeah that's actually how i got hired at, at um product hunt was there was a maker community if you were a maker on product hunt you could be part of maker hunt i have to be mm. careful how i say that and as part of maker hunt there was just like you would interview people who were makers and it was a slack group and there was a, yeah. a guy eric willis who was like a prolific hunter on product hunt and then i just sort of was like that annoying person in slack all the time messaging people and asking like hey anyone need any help with anything i can't quite do much but right just be vocal and then i asked i said to him like oh i'll do all the amas because we were doing them in slack which is a horrendous way to read through an ama <laughs> So I would just yeah. basically pull them out, copy paste into medium posts. And we did like two or three a day for like a month. And every mm. day I'd have to like put all those and we do that as, as a way to it's just a lot of work. Off. Yeah. But it's like a way to kick off people talking and people feel like it's just a natural way to then now ask questions in this place, wherever that mm-hmm. place is. It's like, Oh yeah, well, I've asked things before. It was maybe in a different thread of some, something else, but it's like a, a really simple way to, almost trick people (laughs) like make them feel comfortable in that in that in that room yeah i think so and i i I like that like all these early community stories are like like none of them are super clever like no one's like a a mad scientist genius who figured out some crazy way to grow a community it's more just like you spend a little bit of time thinking about like what people want and then you just do a lot of work and what's cool about that is i think you know there are two types of problems when you're trying to start a company there's like i think the First class is like, these are the problems where it's a lot of work, where you know the price that you have to pay or the cost of getting the thing that you want. And it's just a question of like, do you want to do it? Like, do you want to spend hours every week wrangling everybody together and asking questions and generating discussions? Or do you not want to? And if you want to do it, then you're going to get the success probably that you want. And if you don't want to do it, then it's not going to work. And then there's a whole other class of problems that are like, you've got to be crazy clever. Like you don't even know what the answer is, or maybe you do know how to do it, but you're not even sure if you're talented enough to do it. And there's like the really hard kind of scary problems where like, do you really want to base your business's success on this problem that you don't even know if you can solve? So I like community because it's like, you can start a community and you know exactly what you need to do. Generate a lot of discussion, make everybody feel welcome, be consistent and keep doing it for months. And it's not that hard to do. No, and I like that you actually, you started off with a very calculated approach of, well, I need people to have content to talk about. I need to like have a place to feel that. I need to build up this email list so that I can message them all of the time to keep on going back yeah. to this community and just like, I don't know that people think that through. And when we are sharing these early community stories, they mm-hmm. are all basic and like, yeah, you just got to do a lot of work for doing this stuff. And there is like a number of things probably in a checklist that you can think of for this is how you can build a community. Right. But I don't know if people are always just asking those questions so much because they're thinking there must be a quicker way or an easier way or one, like <laughs> one silver bullet. They're just, like these other people maybe have done it wrong. I'm sure there's another way to do it. And right. it's, I think it's probably just another, another, uh, like excuse. Um, I went to, um, I went on this, uh, backpacking trip with my friend in Seattle the other week and he flew in from Atlanta and he like planned this whole trip and he's like, we're going to go to these hot springs and it's like an 11 mile hike in. And like, I'm like, Oh, that sounds like a nightmare. I don't want to walk 11 miles with a heavy ass backpack, but we did it and we went there and it was beautiful. And guess what? Like nobody else was there. And the reason nobody else is there is because it was a three hour drive and an 11 mile hike uphill to get there. And I think that's kind of like, if you're trying to start any sort of thing, that's an advantage. Like when you know it's a lot of work and it's hard to get there, like that's the reason why you can start things because you know, most people aren't going to do the work. So if you're going to start a community, it's like, I don't think you should be sad that you have to put in a lot of work. I think you should be happy. That's why no one started the community that you want to start before. Cause like no one else is willing to put in all this work. And then when it comes to um, like, you know, thinking ahead, in a meta sort of way, like this is why I made Indie Hackers, right? We've done like 500 interviews on the website, almost 200 interviews on the podcast. If you just listen to some stories of people who've done what you've done, like they can just tell you all of the roadblocks that they hit and all the issues that they ran into. And then you can just think ahead a little bit, not because like you like suffered through all these ills and all these like terrible happenings. It's because they did all the suffering for you and they just like told you the answer. So I, I really like harp on when people, when I talk to founders, I talk to a lot of founders, like, 
hey, are you like, re- like you sitting down and just thinking through what you're trying to do? Or are you just jumping into what you're trying to do? And like my approach with any hackers might sound like I put a ton of work, but like really it was just a few hours of like reading and thinking about like, what's going to be hard with the community? Oh, it's going to be really hard to get people to come. How can I possibly communicate to people to get them to come? Like maybe if I had a mailing list where I could email them, how could I get them on a mailing list? You need some sort of content where you have a mailing list capture form. It doesn't take rocket, it's like not rocket science. A million people have done it, but it's really easy to just get started without thinking about that stuff in advance. So I think it's worth, it's waiting gold, you know, to just put a few hours in, in the beginning, a few hours in every month, just questioning what you're doing and, and thinking up the strategy. Yeah. I think that's like, and it's all like playbookable. Like you definitely, those steps totally. that you're talking about. I think it was, I think it was your interview with, um, I forget his name, the guy from Codapad. I think yeah, it was there. Yeah. He's, he's great to listen to. I think it was one of, I think it was that interview to say there's like step one and then there's step 10. You're going to get to step 10. But you don't know, like you can't just get to step 10. There's steps two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exactly. You go through all of those ones. So if it's a community, one is like getting the content or in whatever order there's how people mm-hmm. to message. There's like some of them, there's probably like creating habits. So that's, leads me to like, did you have some sort of habit that you were trying to get people to say, right, you're going to post in a certain way or have some sort of right. like practice of this is how I want people to converse. So this is how I'm going to mm. get them to do that. Is that anything you, you did there or just. Yeah. So I think there's like a, a few variables that you can, can control when you're creating a community. And what you're talking about is like a really big one, which is like, what type of discussion do we have here? And I think every community has like, you know, somewhere on the spectrum of like, we don't care at all. You figure it out all the way up to like, this is the only type of question that you can ask. Like I'm a part of this growth marketers community that's in Slack. And I've been and part of so many Slack communities that are all crappy, but this one was like, you join, there's like a million rules, like break the rule, we'll kick you out. But it like the community runs like really well because of these rules. And they're like, you have to ask questions like this. It can't be selfish questions. It can only be questions where the answers will help everybody who's reading, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's not as many questions, but they're all super good. And so everybody stays in that community. But Indie Hackers, I, I didn't think about that at all. I was just 100%. This is an open forum. You can ask whatever you want. I'm delighted if someone asks, you know, what's the weather outside? I just want people to talk. Yeah. And because I had curated a list of people who were all coming for these interviews, it was kind of self-selecting. Like the only people who were going to join the community and who were on the email list were people who were trying to build bootstrapped, you know, tech companies. And so all of their questions just happened to be around that. And so I like, you know, I'm an example of someone who didn't put a lot of thought into that. I think the other two things you can think about besides just um, what kind of questions and discussions you want people in your community to have, uh, you can think about time and space are the, the two other things. So time is like, when does your community convene, right? Is it like an always online, always open thing? Um, if that's the case, like it's probably going to be pretty hard to start your community in the beginning because it's going to feel dead (laughs) all the time because it's always there, right? Some communities, like this is like, we've created like almost a miniature community here of like us, you know, 14 people. This is a very time constrained community. It only exists for an hour on a Thursday and then it's going to poof and be gone. But for the time that it exists, it feels very active. You're talking, I'm talking, people are asking questions. And so the community is providing a lot of value. And it's easier to do that, even though you don't have thousands of people because you've constrained the time. And you can do the same thing with space. So if you look at this as a community, like the space is constrained. We don't have 20 conversations going on. We don't have like a huge website that shows a whole list of different posts that have to be. There's one conversation going on. And so it feels very active. And so I think, you know, these are kind of tricks you can use to get your community started if you're like pretty small and you don't have a mailing list of thousands of people. Just shrink these other two aspects. And even with only a few people, your community will feel really good and really big. Like if I tried to start a community that was going to be an online forum and I only had a small number of people, like the forum would have like maybe like one question a day, you know, and it'd be like, this is the daily question. And it's really easy to make one question a day look really active. But if I tried to start with like 20 questions a day, it would just look dead. No one would like it. It'd feel like a shitty community and uh, it would be really hard to start. So I would say like, think about the time, think about the space and think about like the format, right? Are you coming up with the questions? Do you ask people to come up with questions? Um, are there guidelines or are there not? And like, that depends on like who's in your community. Yeah, I think it's it, like, as much as it's important to, I mean, you can just think of the top level of that. Is it like, is it open? Is it more constrained rather than these are the potent, like these are the exact discussions that we want to try and have, right? So I think it's more around, yeah, like you said, thinking of the time and space and the format. 
Um, and pe- and people, F dot people. Well, that's like a crucial part of it. Like a lot of communities start by like, we're going to get a ton of experts in. Um, a lot of people, a lot of communities are like mine. I'm like, mine are like, it's, and the hackers is like, this is totally open. Anybody can join this. It's public. Everybody can read every single thing that's here. It's not private. Um, and like, you just get different dynamics, you know, like there's a community full of experts. What happens is the experts don't want noobs to join because then it dilutes the value of the community. They like the exclusivity and everybody who's like slightly less expert than them really wants to get in because it feels exclusive. And like, if that's the value you want to deliver, like you should be deliberate about that and make sure you start with experts, but also realize that your community is going to decline in value as you grow. If you go that route, whereas like ND hackers is very like deliberately not that it's meant to be open. It's meant to always be public. I don't want it to feel like an exclusive community. And that has like some benefits, which is everybody can join. And it's got some downsides, which is like experts don't want to be a part of it because they're like, well, this is a bunch of noobs or below my level, blah, 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 whatever they want to say. And it's maybe harder to get like high quality content. So like, these are all levers you can pull and you should think about them deliberately if you can. Yeah, that makes sense. If you were rebuilding, if you were to rebuild Indie Hackers today, would you do it the way you did? Like, would you build it yourself? Would you use a platform, like use a tool out there? If so, which one? I would do a lot of the things the same. I think like, I mean, obviously it like worked out for me. <laughs> I didn't expect to be acquired by Stripe, but like that happened. And that was like a way better outcome than I ever wanted. I just wanted to make like five or six grand a month so I could pay, <laughs> pay my rent and then figure out what to do. Um, I'm a software engineer. It's really easy for me to build software. I can build, like I built the Indie Hackers Forum from scratch in about a week. Um, and that was with me adding like all sorts of like bells and whistles and design stuff. Like I could have done it in a few days and we just wanted like the rough outline of it. And so if I could go back and do it again, I would certainly do it that way. I would make better decisions in some aspects like I wasn't aware of at the time. Um, but I do think it's kind of unnecessary. Like if I wasn't a software engineer, I would almost certainly use some off the shelf software. And I would think about, you know, maybe trans, like, do you really even need your own software? Like, why do you want that to be the case for me? it's cool now because it's Stripe, but we have like these super grand ambitions and we need to be a platform and, you know, be humongous. But if you just want a place where you're just like a, a small community or even like a medium or large size community, and it doesn't need to be super special and custom, like you can use a Facebook group. You can use a WhatsApp group. Like I know people who started communities on Skype and then transitioned to like WhatsApp groups and then wow. transitioned to Slack. And then like, it, like you kind of lose some people in the transition, but the, usually not the active people. And you can be bigger and bigger, like, and grow organically that way. So, um, and there's also advantages to doing that. Like if you have a Facebook group, guess what? No one has to have it, have a habit of coming to your community. They already have a habit of going to Facebook and assuming there's posts in your community, then, you know, every two or three times you go to Facebook, there's going to be a post right there from your community front and center where they can see you. So uh, it's very hard to build a habit of people going directly to your website unless you want them to do it like, you know, once a week in response to like an AMA or an event happening. Uh, with indie hackers, like what I want is for people to like reflexively <laughs> sign on and be like, what's going on in indie hackers? And that's, that's a super hard habit to build. So um, for me, I would do it the same because that's what I want to go for. But I think others should consider like, you know, what's, what's easier, what's an easier ask of people and what's like the easiest way to get started and maybe be a little bit more ambitious later on once you've conquered some of these early goals. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> so when you said, obviously being acquired by Stripe was way bigger outcome than you thought. I mean, that might not be completely true. I I suppose at some point you might have changed your mind there, but you wanted to get five, six K a month. How, I know you started with some ads. So what was the, like the monetary thought there? Like, how are you going to, how were you going to fund it? And then how would you fund it knowing what you know now? Like, what would you do if you're (laughs) building that community and then, right, you have to get to five, five K a month. So it's a million dollar question. What would I do? So I did fund it. I did get to about seven and a half thousand dollars a month in revenue and about eight months. And that's when Stripe acquired Indie Hacker. So I was paying my rent. I got to it, my goal right at the end. Um, what I did was the sponsorships and advertising. Like in my case, I was lucky. There were enough people who wanted to be a part of this community where like I could actually go to sponsors. Like it, it's hard to go to sponsors if you don't have a lot of traffic, quite frankly. With Indie Hackers, it was like right off the bat, we were getting 50, 60, 70,000 visits a month to the website because there was so much pent up demand for this and it just didn't exist because I got lucky with the timing and no one had built this. So I was able to go to advertisers and be like, hey, I've got a podcast, eventually at a mailing list, I have a website, um, you pay me, you know, four or 500 bucks a week and I will put you in front of all these indie hackers. And so it wasn't super hard to convince sponsors to do that. Also because the target market where people, <laughs> these are all like software engineers and startup founders who like yeah. have a lot of money and are willing to spend a lot of money because they're trying to like build companies. And so a lot of advertisers are like, oh yeah, we'd love to be in front of this audience. And I learned a lot about like which advertisers are good, which advertisers are a pain in the ass, which advertisers are willing to spend a lot of money, which ones aren't. 
Um, but ultimately I didn't like the ad business because it misaligns your incentives, right? Like no, no one who comes to your community is like, if only there were more ads, right? And when you're working in the community, you're not thinking like, if only I could just get more ads. Like you want the money for sure, but like you're really thinking about how to make your community better and like building new features and having more AMAs and events and stuff. And like, I was spending half my week just selling ads. So if I could go back and do it all over again, I wouldn't have done the advertiser model, I don't think. Or I would have been a little bit cleverer about it. Like I think one cool advertiser model, like we both know Lintai, and you've done this a little bit with MakerPad, but I like this idea of native ads where the content that you're producing that people are actually coming for is itself an ad, if that makes sense. Like you do a Google search and there's like, you're like, you know, what's the tallest building in the world? And like the first result comes up and it gives you the answer and that's an ad. Like you don't care if it's an ad, you'll click it because it answers your question. The intent is there. It's not something random. With any hackers, people were coming for like these interviews to learn about companies. I would have probably found a way to like charge companies to do these interviews. So that way I do what I'm doing anyway. I'm already doing these interviews, but then I'm getting paid to do it. And then users and readers aren't like put off by it because they're getting to like get all these internal details. So I probably been a little bit more clever early on about how I could like do sponsorships and ads that relate to, to exactly what I'm doing. I don't know if I would have charged community members right off the bat because I wanted indie hackers to be open and I wanted it to be big. Like I knew from the beginning, I wanted as many people to join as possible, but I might've eventually done some sort of, um, you know, extra membership or something, you know, you can get an AMA if you pay extra, et cetera. And I think that might be like a good upgrade for people who like want, who are a little bit more serious about starting companies and being indie hackers. And that probably could have, I'm certainly like with the membership by now, probably could have made a lot of money <laughs> off even just 1% of the indie hackers who subscribe to that. But at the time I wasn't really thinking that vein and didn't have much time to even try it out. Yeah. It's interesting. You said about the ads, you don't, you wouldn't like necessarily do that, but I think even, yeah, like Lynn with key values, it's like a job. Having a job post is like the most natural ad on like mm -hmm. format out there. Um, so I think that, that would be an inter that would have been an interesting one to have like, a interview with companies i mean it's almost, it's almost it's not anywhere near like this but it's almost like when people ask you to be featured in like a tech magazine and then say you got to pay 5k to be like to do that right. <laughs> like yeah obviously glad you didn't do that but it's yeah it's almost like i think there is something something close there or there's like yeah that's interesting I got a, a email the other day. It's like, oh, you've been nominated for a Webby Award. Uh, you got to pay 385 bucks to accept the nomination and be considered to potentially win the award. Or um, a lot of media companies do this, which I think is really interesting. Like if you look at the Inc. 500 or Inc. 5000 or whatever, yeah. it's like the yeah. 5,000 fastest growing companies in America. And it's like actually every single one of these companies paid you, paid Inc. to be featured on that list. And there's a lot of companies that don't pay that just don't get included. Yeah. And as a reader, you're like, oh, I'm glad to get this information. But like, no, these are just kind of like, ways that these media companies make a ton of money so that's a possibility i don't think i would have gone exactly no, that route no i believe you would not have done it like that either um so if we go into like the the growth phase we started talking about this just before we were supposed to kick off really um mm -hmm. so and you've mentioned whilst we've been talking about like turning the community into a platform what's the what is the distinction there what's the thinking behind it and what is like what does that look yeah. like in your head? So yeah, this is an interesting thing. Like there's all sorts of different models for how people interact online. And like, if you want to use an analogy of like a real world space, which I think is a good analogy for like online businesses, like uh, you can think of an audience, right? Somebody on a stage talking to a group of people who are not on the stage. Like that's an audience model. you got one person talking, a lot of people listening. A community model is almost the exact same thing, but there is no stage. Everybody who's not on the stage is talking to each other. And the value that they get is from the other people who are in the crowd. Um, and then you've got like a platform, which I think of as like a space where there are lots of stages and lots of people talking to an audience on the stage. So this is like, you know, if you go to like a, uh, like a trade show or something, a trade show is kind of like a platform. Everybody's got booths and there's lots of people who come to like talk to people who run the booths. But then there's like someone who actually owns that, that trade show and is probably making a lot of money, like, you know, getting people to pay for booths, getting people to charge for like, you know, come to the thing. And that's what I think of as a platform. So Good examples of platforms online, like Twitter is a platform. Pretty much all these social networks are like platforms. And YouTube is a platform, Twitch is a platform, TikTok is a platform, where you have people who are actually like two roles, like creators and like an audience for these creators. And the really good thing about a platform as opposed to a community is that 
quite frankly, like people in a community are not necessarily there to create good content. They're not there necessarily to teach others. Often like there's this really cool ethos where like people in a community ask for help and it turns out other people in the community can help them and other people want to pay it forward and help out, which happens a ton on indie hackers. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's like why people come to your community or, or that people who are helping are particularly good at it. Whereas when you have people who like are deliberately there to be on the stage, to have a booth at the trade show or to like have a Twitter account where they're sharing their information or a Substack account where they're writing a newsletter. Like those people tend to be experts. They tend to share really good content and they tend to just be um, value adds for like everybody else who's there. So with indie hackers in particular, like we kind of have always had this like two track thing or like I'm always interviewing people. I've never stopped interviewing people and these people have a lot to share and we've always had a community. And those things have like never really been connected. They've been disconnected. Like you might listen to the podcast, but like that has nothing to do with the community forum. And so what I'm thinking about nowadays is like, how do I transition indie hackers from a community into a platform? Like how do I essentially incentivize people? Incentives are like the, the main thing because everybody does things that are, you know, to their own benefit. How do I incentivize somebody like you, who's an expert on a particular topic to spend time on indie hackers, actually sharing your knowledge with people in the community? And right now there isn't a huge incentive to do that, right? That's a lot of time. It's a lot of effort on your part. You've got other things to do, but every successful platform has figured out a way to give people an incentive to come talk to an audience. And I think online, usually the two incentives are around um, status and revenue specifically. I mean, Twitter, it's almost all status, build up your following. Um, Instagram, like similarly, but like there's also like influencer marketing where people are now turning their audiences and their status into revenue. Then there are platforms that are just more specifically about revenue, like Substack. You start a newsletter, you charge people for access, they pay you to read your newsletter. And when people have these incentives that actually give them a reason to like do all this hard work and like put together really good newsletters and put together rather really like good blog posts or whatever, then they work much harder at doing those things and they put together better content. And that benefits literally everybody. It's a win for the audience because now they have a lot more to read when they come to this platform. It's a win for the creators because now they have something to gain when they're putting in all this work. I think if you don't have the right incentives, it's really hard to build a platform and it's really hard to help your community improve the quality of its content. So with Andy Hackers in particular, like one of the things that I think is like, curiously, there aren't any really big communities online of startup founders. Like startups have been a thing for 20 years, like name another big startup founder community. Like Reddit, it's got a couple subreddits, r slash startups and r slash entrepreneurs. They're not very active. They don't retain users. There's a lot of churn. Twitter is arguably the best community for startups, I think, but it's not really a community. It's kind of like a nebulous thing and it's not really well-defined like what the community is. Hacker News, like startups are only like a small subsection of it. So it's like the question I found myself asking while I was growing the indie hackers community and running into all these problems like years after I started it, it was like, why hasn't anyone else done this? And it turns out there's just like a natural kind of challenge where um, everybody's incentive when they're a startup founder is to kind of promote their own thing. And that doesn't necessarily lead to like a super healthy community. Like even Product Hunt, like why do people share their products on Product Hunt? Because they want to get upvotes to promote their own thing, right? Yeah. It's kind of the essential driver. So every community, depending on who's, part, who's, who's there and why they're there, is going to have different kinds of posts. And it's difficult to, I think, sometimes control what people post um, because people have their own incentives. And so uh, a big part of what I wanted to do is, okay, think about how do I get people to make sort of less repetitive, more generally helpful posts that aren't like only self-serving? And I think, you know, being a platform and figuring out ways to incentivize all of these experts who have things they want to share is, is kind of the ticket. So that's what I'm working on today. And uh, three or four months from now, from now, I will know if I succeeded or failed or I need to try another approach. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's interesting because it's, it's something we've thought about, or at least I've thought about internally. And it's, yeah, thinking of incentivizing people. But even, so the way, I mean, I used to go on Indie Hackers a lot. And admittedly, mm -hmm. I don't now. But yep. only... Because, like, is that, a, is that a feature or a bug that I was just, like, trying to be an indie hacker and trying to get to this, this certain stage? So I was in mm. those conversations. And then when you get to, like, okay, I've got a company to run, and now there's revenue and there's, like, all these things, you almost graduate off that platform, which exactly. is kind of a good thing, but kind of not a good thing because then all the people you want to then give information back to the aspiring yep. people have then almost gone... Yep. into a different place so you want them to like go okay do you want to come up to the stage now and do some sort of like helpful thing a mastermind session like this which is a smaller group mm. and whatever it is it's like those are interesting things to think about it's the same with no code it's at some point 
you probably graduate where you know how to build stuff now with no code. So like, yep. do you leave Makerpad or do you just, do we need to keep on making the more advanced stuff or do we yeah. figure out a way that you then can give back and make money and eyeballs from the community you're already in? So I think that's- I've had this conversation a million times. Like, hey, Indie Hackers is so cool. I'm like, oh yeah, like, uh, you know, how did it help you? Like, oh, I met my co-founder in Indie Hackers and we got into YC. I'm like, what do you think about it now? They're like, oh, I don't go anymore. <laughs> uh, and it's the same thing. It's like graduated is the right word. Or like they yeah. went there, it's like school. You know, they met friends, they decided to go into business together. They learned a lot of stuff and then they just graduated. And I think that's completely fine if your business model is in line with that. Like if you're, for example, literally a school well, they pay tuition to get there. Yeah. Uh, you, no school needs everybody to like never graduate. They're cool. There's going to be a new class of students coming in. And to some degree, that's ha what happens with indie hackers. So the community's only ever gotten bigger, but there's still a lot of churn as well. But I don't have a business model with indie hackers. Like Stripe doesn't want us to, like, we don't charge money. Stripe's like, no, just make it really big. And if yeah. you want to make something really big and influential, uh, you don't want graduation. Like you don't want churn. Uh, suddenly it doesn't matter that like people paid tuition or whatever. Like you want people to stay. And so I think that's like a, a whole challenge and it's, it's an interesting problem, but I've learned a lot just in the last like few weeks really about how other platforms do it. And it's, I'm pretty excited to like experiment in that road. Yeah. Well, I'll be looking out for, for ideas to steal as well. So um, I think the, what you have with the, I don't know what you call them, like the spaces. So like you've got a group for no code. Or yeah. Whatever. We've got groups. Yeah. yeah. So to me, this seems like some sorts of, okay, you were on Indie Hackers previously before you started your company your company is now a no code company. Like, why aren't you now automatically like here are the graduates in the no code company as the experts? Yep. Like this is where they are. And even if it's like linking to your Twitter straight away or whatever it is, mm -hmm. like, Oh, I heard from you from Indie Hackers. And that's like, okay, that's a tick. I should be spending more time there. And it almost needs yeah. to force speed people like that. Yeah. Um, okay. We got a couple of questions. And then I think we'll wrap it up. Um, so Tessa asked earlier, um, hey, Cortland, can you talk a little bit about those early interviews that you mentioned? How many did you do before going live with them? Did they have a particular format? What would you do differently? I'm thinking of using a similar approach for the community I'm building. We're helping mm -hmm. high school athletes get to the NS NCAA by sharing the experiences of former college athletes. Right. Interesting. Okay. So, um, just answer these questions sort of rapid fire. I did 10 interviews before I went live with them. Um, the goal for me is I just wanted like a package of interviews where when people showed up on day one, they didn't just have like one interview they could read, they could read a lot. And that's because all the interviews were for founders from different industries and different experiences. And like, if there's only one or two interviews, like people might be like, this site sucks. You know, I want to build a SaaS company and neither of these interviews are SaaS companies. Uh, and then like, right, I kind of like this grid on the homepage and right in the middle of the grid was like subscribe to our mailing list. And then when you click into an interview at the very bottom, it was also like subscribe to our mailing list in terms of the format, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like I did a lot of research to find out like what my intended readers wanted to learn about. I didn't just sort of randomly guess like, oh, I'm going to ask this question and this question. It was specifically like, I have seen people on forums earlier asking these questions, trying to learn. So I'm going to make sure every one of my, one of my interviews asks these same questions. And so I had like a standard template of questions. I asked everybody the same eight questions, you know, how'd you get started? How much re revenue are you making? How did you come up with the idea? How did you get your first few users? How have you grown from there? What have been the biggest difficulties? What are your trip, you know, biggest tips and tricks and productivity hacks? Um, what would you do differently? Like a bunch of questions like this that like everybody always wanted. So it wasn't like guess and check. And again, a lot of other interview sites out there had already existed and like weren't asking these questions because they didn't do the research. And subsequently, there have been like a lot of sites that have copied indie hackers and just copied my questions, but tried to take it to some other market. And like, that doesn't work because your other different market cares about different questions. So I think you have to be very deliberate there. Um, you should also think about like the format in general. Like the reason why I did interviews and text is because I knew that my audience like is a bunch of tech nerds like me who want to like sit on their computers and like read text interviews, right? Athletes might want to watch YouTube videos, right? Maybe they don't read blog posts. And so you should think about like what medium even matters. Like the whole thing needs to be constructed from the ground up by reverse engineering what your target audience already wants, the channels they already hang out in and like the ways that they behave. It can't be kind of you just come up with an idea out of, a blue, out of the blue and try to force it onto people because it's not a natural thing for them. So uh, I think what you're doing is cool. Like trying to be an athlete and get into the NCAA is not an easy thing to do. And I think probably there's a lot of demand there. Um, and it's... Uh, 
seems like something where there's like enough confusion and like questions that probably a lot of kids and probably a lot of parents have questions and would love to hear like answers from real people. Other things you might want to think about is like the size of your market. You know, how many NCAA athletes are there or high school athletes are there? And like, I don't know if you want to monetize or whatever, but like how much money do these people have? That was a big question for me. Like, you know, if I target a particular customer set, like, do they have money to pay me with? Or do they have money to like pay my advertisers with? And maybe like athletes don't. And like, these are the kind of questions that are important that you can ask before you even get started. Cause they're going to determine like the limits of your business, you know, how big your business can get, how successful it can be, how hard it is, et cetera. So uh, good luck. I think it's a cool idea. Uh, there's a lot of cool strategy you could probably do there. Awesome. And then we've got one more from Frank. How do you think about community becoming one of the common starting points for founders to start a software company or even for existing software companies to establish a community, especially as creating the software itself seems to get more commoditized? Yeah. So I don't know if it's a great starting point for starting a software company. I think it depends on what you want to do. Um, Like if I wanted to start a SaaS business, you know, like some sort of tool that I coded up, like, I don't think I would start a community necessarily. I would probably just start that SaaS business. <laughs> I think it depends on like, w- like what your channels for acquisition are because community can become a channel. For example, like I said, Hacker News is a channel, uh, community and Reddit's a community. A lot of people start SaaS businesses and then they get their first users by just like posting in Hacker News and Reddit. They don't need to go build their own community. There are already existing communities and like they go there to find users. And so I, if you're thinking about starting a community in order to do some other thing, you should really ask yourself, like, is this a necessary step? Like, what do I want to get out of starting this community? And there are certain things you can get, like with Andy Hackers in particular, again, I was really lucky on the timing. Like there are bootstrappers for five, 10 years before I ever started doing Andy Hackers, but luckily no one had started an online community. And the cool thing about a community is that like you get network effects, which means that because the value is coming from the people in your community, like I'm not teaching everybody how to start a startup. They're teaching each other and helping each other out. That means that the more people there are in the community, the more likely you are to get an answer to your question, the more likely you, there is to be someone who has a really good answer to your question. And so you have this network effect where it's like almost this flywheel where the more people you get, the better your community is, which makes it much harder for anybody to assault your community and come in like and eat your lunch a year or two later. Like a lot of people have tried starting any hackers and it's really hard to compete with a community of 100,000 people and be more valuable when you have a community of like only five or 10 people. And so uh, if that's one of the advantages of community, you can think about like, how do you apply that, right? Like network effects are a really good moat. If you want to start like some sort of VC funded unicorn company, it's good to have a moat and like maybe a community is like a good way to get there. Right. When I joined Stripe, like, again, my ambitions for indie hackers are pretty, like pretty modest. I was like, I want to like start a business where I can make money and pay my own rent. And I joined Stripe and Patrick Lawson's like, no, 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 no. You need to create the platform. That's the premier, you know, breeding ground for founders the world over. And that, Uh, has millions of people, which is a level I wasn't even thinking about. But like he saw the network effects and he like had on his to-do list for like things Stripe might be able to do was like, maybe we should start our own community because he wanted Stripe to be able to capture like this entire market. So I would think about like why you want to start a community, uh, what size you want your community to be a part of. Like maybe it's not the first thing you do. Maybe it's a subsequent thing you do. Maybe it's a thing you do in parallel with your product. Like I know MakerPad has a community and it's a cool value add. I don't know how crucial it is to MakerPad. Like maybe it's an essential part of bench strategy or not, but Again, these are all things that you can think about in relation to like your specific situation. And like, there's nobody out there who's going to tell you what the right answer is. It depends hundred percent on what your goal is with your business and like what would make you happy as a founder. Uh, and then finally you said, you know, there's existing soft, uh, creating the software itself seems to get more commoditized. So yeah, like there's a lot of commoditized community software. Um, God, I've been approached by so many people this year who are like talking about all the SaaS apps they're going to make that will allow other people to build communities. I have mixed feelings about this. Uh, again, I think it's personal. For me with Indie Hackers, like I cared a lot about the brand. This is one of the things I thought about in the first few days. Uh, I was thinking about, okay, what's the name going to be? And like, do I care about branding? Because I'd started companies in the past where I just hadn't put that much thought into it. And then later on, I regretted it. And again, this wasn't like weeks of thought. This was just like a few hours of me like reading some blog posts on branding and looking at some other companies I admired and then trying to see if I could do the same thing. Super simple. Anyone can do it. And so I just had two big decisions. Um, one of them was the name. I wanted to name my community after the people who were a part of it. So I had to come up with my own term. Like indie hackers is not a real word. Like it's a thing that I came up with that didn't exist before. And it's taken years to get to this point, but now it's pretty cool because people will just like on their own refer to themselves as indie hackers, which like builds up my brand and helps me out when it's better than people referring to themselves as like makers or creators or founders or whatever, because that's very generic and not owned by anyone. So 
branding, like that doesn't tie directly into like whether you use off the shelf software, but it's kind of related. The second thing ties more directly into it is like kind of your look. And with indie hackers, again, there are a ton of other websites, a ton of people with medium blogs and publications, and they all look the exact same white background, black text, et cetera. You would go there, you would read an interview, you'd read a blog post, and you wouldn't even remember what site you read it on because it all looked the same. So I'm like, indie hackers is going to be dark blue with white text and it's going to look different than everybody else. And I don't care if it's unreadable. I don't care if it's like not the most optimal thing for the brand. I just want when people come to indie hackers a second time for them to say like, oh yeah, I've been here before. This website looks way different than every other website. And that was literally as easy as coloring it blue. And I think if you like use some of this off the shelf commodity software, like it's just kind of difficult with your brand because your websites can look like everybody else's. You know, there is no website that looks like Product Hunt. Product Hunt has a designer who designed it. It looks distinctively like Product Hunt. Like Andy Hackers looks exactly like itself. And so you should think about, again, like depending on what your goals are, maybe that doesn't matter. But if you're going to use off-the-shelf software, like realize like that's sort of a trade-off, you know, it's like you get, it's much easier and cheaper to get started and faster, but like you're much less distinct. You're a little bit less memorable. You know, if you start a Facebook group, like do you even control the people who are on your platform? And, you know, so it's, it's all trade-offs and you should think about like what it is that you want to do. Awesome. <clears throat> um, one question from me, just to finish off, if, if we've still got a minute. Um, yeah. So with these other software companies that enable you to create communities, there's often a focus on here's, like, here's your members and here's all the different types of subgroups you can create like straight away. Mm-hmm. What would be your approach or what do you think people's approach would be? I think the standard or the default is well, I'm going to create a space, that's definitely for me anyway, is I'm going to create a space for introductions. This is where people show off their products. This is where people talk about, like, ask questions. This right. is, like, Founder Friday. Well, like, everything separate. Yeah. Like, what's Prompts, kind of. Yeah. Um, so for me, this is almost like, okay, imagine a community being, like, a real-world place, right? What are all these places? Like, the rooms, really. So, like, a community that doesn't have any of these places is one big room where everybody is at the same time. A community that's got, like, a place to show off your products, a place to ask questions is like, it's kind of like a hallway with a bunch of different branching rooms. And if you think about like, okay, well, when would you want that in real life? Probably only when you have enough people to like start filling up these rooms, right? Like if you had like your first community meeting with 10 people, like you wouldn't want to have a bunch of different rooms. So I always try to force myself to think that way. Cause when you get onto the internet, like there's no like real, like you don't, like we didn't evolve to like browse the internet. We evolved to exist in physical spaces. So it's really hard to think about like what makes sense on the internet. So I always like to, to, make the analogy to the real world. And like, based on that, like I would probably not start a community by having a lot of different spaces to do different things when I know I don't have a lot of people. But once I start getting more and more people, I might start adding different rooms. And just again, like always having this real world analogy in my mind of like, does this make any sense at all? With Indie Hackers, like we only recently added a groups feature. And now we've got like 300 groups and some of them are pretty big. But like we waited until the community was like really big to start adding these groups because I thought most of the groups were just going to be dead, you know? And like, we don't have the kind of growth growth that Reddit has. Like Reddit has tens of millions of people. Like they can afford to have a ton of subreddits. There's another thing that's like not obvious. Um, when you see something like Reddit and they have all these subreddits, like most subreddits are dead. Like only like the top 1% of subreddits have any traffic whatsoever. And those are the ones that they show you, but the rest of them, like they're like whoever created them or ran them, like gave up. And they died. And so like, if you want to have like some sort of user managed groups like that, like you need to have enough users that even if 90% of them fail, there's 10% is still enough groups and rooms that like you can show them in a sidebar on your website and it's fine. Same with like Twitter hashtags. Like I tried this on Indie Hackers once where like, oh, we should have hashtags and let people create hashtags. Doesn't work unless you have like millions of users because all the hashtags are going to be shitty and look really bad. And the only reason they don't look bad on Twitter is because they're showing like the top 10 hashtags out of 100 million people who've made hashtags, which will be good. But if they only had 100 people making hashtags, like they wouldn't be able to show you 10 good ones. It'd be like maybe one good one. So I think you need to wait until you are a big enough size to even try any of the stuff really. Yeah, that makes sense. Definitely. Well, I really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your behind the scenes and community thoughts. Um, I think it was a great session. I think everyone will agree. Um, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. I love talking about this stuff. And if anybody wants to DM me on Twitter with follow-up questions, uh, I'll probably respond. <laughs> Sometimes I forget. I get really behind. But yeah, I, no, I, I like talking about this stuff. Maastrix on that. But yeah, I'll try. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks so much for coming. And uh, we'll chat to you soon. All right. Cheers. Later, everybody. Thanks for coming. See you, man. Bye.